Thank you very much, Paul, firstly, for coming on to the podcast. It means a huge deal to us. Um, and what an incredible career you've had, by the way. 287 games and 13 goals for Burnley and a long, successful career. Starting right out at the outset, you're not actually from the north, but from Brighton. How did it come about getting that move up north? started when I was playing non-league for um, a little old Worthing uh, mm-hmm. back in 1990, 1991. I was, I was 16. I just left school uh, and I was playing in their first team at a young age. And, and basically, to cut a long story short and bore you all, is that the manager, John Murray at the time, was an ex-Burnley player. He decided to leave Worthing because money situations and stuff like that. And he just said, look, come on, I'm going to take you up to Burnley for, um, for a trial just to see how you get on. Me, I was, you know, I loved me football, but weren't quite sure where Burnley was in the country. But um, yeah, it, it worked out quite well. Quite a big, a big lifestyle change at what must have been a young age then, Paul. That did you have to come up on your own, or was how did that work for you? Well, it was just basically a, a week's trial, um, just to see if I can get an apprenticeship. So it was a case of um, got a, a lift up because um, my mum and dad's car wouldn't make it that far um, and, and basically just stayed in the hotel, stayed in the Hawthorns over in Nelson, stayed yep. actually with, at the time, uh, Mick Conroy and Mark Yates, first team players. Wow. Mick Conroy, yeah. absolute hero of mine. <laughs> yeah, some great players, great lads, really. Uh, yeah. And they were good because I'm 16 and they looked after me. They really yeah. did. Took me into training. I got to do all the usual jobs with the, uh, the apprentices, cleaning boots, all that sort of stuff, um, and basically played one game um, and that was it. That was my chance. Play one game, do well. If you don't, you're back down south. So I happened to do all right, to be fair. Um, we played against Berry uh, in the, I don't know if you remember back in the early 90s, it was the A and the B team league back then. But I played in a B team game um, on that Saturday morning, uh, scored a goal. We were winning 1 0. I got a dead leg, went off with 10 minutes to go, and we drew 1 all. So that made it, you know, made it look better. So, and that was a start, two year apprenticeship from then. Brilliant. So you find you made your way through your apprenticeship and, and through the reserves. Finally made your your first team debut in the ninety five ninety six season, uh, which was a time when Burnley were undergoing uh, a change after a long successful period under Jimmy Mullen and Adrian Heath stepped up uh, to become manager around that time. What was the atmosphere around around about? Sorry, what was the atmosphere like around that time? Um, end of Jimmy's time and and what was it like breaking through into into a team after that successful spell? Um, the weirdest part about it all is when you're only 20 years old, you're sort of oblivious to what's going on in the bigger picture. Yeah. You don't realise what the boardroom's like. You don't realise what the manager's going through. You just sort of are in your own little world, if you will. Um, senior players are talking to you about what's going on, but you're kind of not really listening. You're just focusing on yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd had my ups and downs with the manager at the time. Jimmy Mullen was a bit... Well, to be honest, he's a bit of a goon, really. He was, he was, he was constantly drinking. He was just a bit of an idiot. Um, but the bloke gave me my opportunity. He gave me my first year, um, first year pro uh, contract, uh, and and it was a fight every year over money. So I didn't really have the respect for him. But I had senior players in me. I had Adrian Ethan in here in my ear all the time, even when he was like a senior pro. He went away and came back to the club to be manager. But he was always in my ear telling me what to do and ignore the manager, blah blah blah. So I don't really understand too much what was going on behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Mullen was under pressure because. He taken us up to the championship. He brought us back down. He kept the job, but we were sort of lingering mid table. Um, so he was under a bit of pressure that side of it. But I just wanted my chance. I was just you know waiting to get in there. Um, I'd had lots of arguments with the manager. I was out of contract. I think my debut was in October sometime. Yeah, and I was still out of contract. We were still arguing from July. Wow. And and I know people will laugh at this, but we were we were we literally arguing over fifty quid. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> wages weren't the greatest back then. Yeah, I was on yeah. I was on two hundred pound a week, and I wanted two hundred and fifty, and he wasn't giving it to me. I was on one seventy. They'd offer me two hundred, and I wanted two fifty. Crazy. I was say, as a player, surely you should be getting that because I mean, fifty quid compared to some players who are probably in that team earning. No, I mean, triple and double that, whatever. But Yeah, I'm not too sure if it was that big. I don't think the wages were that. I'm not so sure there was many people over a £1,000 yeah. back then. Um, but I think Jimmy Mullen was as stubborn as I was. He wasn't wanting to waver a bit. Uh, I'd gone pre-season down to Stoke. Again, Adrian Heath had sorted me out. Go and do pre-season away from the club to sort of wake him up a little bit. You know, try and force him to give you a bit more money. 
um, which in hindsight was a really bad idea because I got to Stoke and done two weeks of pre-season with them. Well, they're known as the biggest running club in the world. You ask Vince Overson, they can run for fun. Well, that two weeks sort of killed me. But I came back firing. I was, you know, I was quite fit, but I just had to buy me time. And the manager just pulled me one day and said, look, you're not going to play in the first team until you sign your contract. I said, well, I'm not signing my contract until you give me some money. So he said, you can play tonight. It was against Leicester in the Carling Cup or whatever it was called back then. Um, he said, see how you get on. And I've done OK. Played in the first team with all the regulars and everything. We got beat, but he said, you've done all right. He said, but you're not playing at the weekend until you sign your contract. So I'm not signing my contract until, until you give me more money. And that stalemate went on into November. Eventually, he then um, said to me, you're playing tonight. You're playing in the... Oh, back then, auto windshield, auto windscreen, whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> and we played um, we played crew. Mm. And again, I, I played quite well. And what it was back then, it was we, it was um, stalemate at 90 minutes and it was one of those golden goals. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kurt and I were going to have scored the was goal. The one where he scored and then ran up. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Ran, right, ran straight down the tunnel. We yeah. were all thinking, where's he gone? But, <laughs> you know, we didn't realise it was golden goal. And that was it. That was after that game. He said to me, he pulled me in the office the day later and just said, right, I'll give you your money. And I went and backdated to the start of the season. And, said, yeah. <laughs> and it was, I got it. It was like, ah, oh, it's like I won the lottery back then. Yeah. So um, I was just in the middle of buying my first house as well. So it was, yeah, it was brilliant. Wow. So that Saturday started the league game and went from there. Do you think that... Like, oh, sorry, go on, Josh. No, I was going to say, do you think that was all, all on the manager then? Or do you think he'd sort of been told by, by the board maybe that this is his budget work within it and... Don't know. You never know who to believe. Yeah. Managers play games with you. Oh, the chairman says this, the chairman says that. And I'm like, well, if you really want me to sign, surely you've got the power for 50 yeah. quid. But yeah. I don't know. They, I think they play off against each other, chairmans and managers. And I know Stan did quite a bit, but I'm not sure whether Jimmy was that clever to do that. You know, like I said, he was, he was, he was half drunk most of the time. So, um, yeah. I'm, I'm not so sure how we play these games. But like I say, I, I had the battles from day one with Jimmy Mullen. Because when I got my first year of pro, I was on, I got a one year contract and all the other boys that year, John Mullen, Chris Brass, all them got three year contracts. He made me fight for my one year contract every year. Okay. Whereas they all got lucrative three years, happy days. I'm not saying it was great money, but they yeah. were like in comfort zone. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm kind of glad looking back that I did get my one years. I'm glad because it kept me on my toes. It kept me fighting. So yeah, I kind of thanked Jimmy for that a bit, I guess. <laughs> I was just going to say about how how good time how much good timing that way when you're saying about he's sort of a bit of a drunk and then Josh is there having a bit of his no, no. his part I thought it couldn't be any more better timing but what was it like then for your first time in the boardroom sort of uh, when when you say it's a bit daunting what was that like sort of as a first impression? Well, it was only Mr. Smith and me and him. I never went in with the actual we weren't the chairman on and all that lot. They they stayed out of it. Um, Back in the early days, it was Teasdale, the chairman. He used to come in the dressing room afterwards to see the lads if we won and give us like, you know, 30 quid to go and spend behind the bar. Very rarely saw the, the directors or anything like that. So, but when we did see them, it was on the coach sometimes. Mm. But you're not really fearful of the chairman or anything like that. It's not the chairman. It's just chairman, really. You just <laughs> rack on. Especially under Stan. They're all scared of Stan. So yeah, it was, absolutely. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously from that, season Paul like you say Jimmy left Adrian came in Adrian Heath uh, player manager too at the thing he was at the time although he weren't playing much but I've always just been interested we've had a few guests on who've worked with player managers like we had Mark Robertson on discussed obviously Chris Waddle um, what was that dynamic like for Adrian then having to step up obviously did he have your respect immediately and how did that dynamic work how was he as a manager for me it worked really well for others, it didn't work very well. Um, for me, it was because we'd had such a good relationship as a young lad coming through and him being a senior player, he was one of them that would talk to you. Yeah. He used to take me off to Goodison Park on a, on a Saturday or Sunday if we had a free weekend and watch Everton. Wow. Him and David Ayres would take us off and, 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 well, in their world, it was like, let's educate you with some great football. <laughs> I sort of just went along with it but yes um, so he, he was always sort of well when he got the job that, that everyone used to give me stick oh your dad's the manager now and like, all this sort of stuff so I sort of I was I was like laughing really when he came in yeah. um, he gave me my, my bigger contract a two year contract first one I ever got um, so I was kind of happy with that but the rest of the dressing room there wasn't as many that were as happy 
and a yeah. lot and there were players that found it strange calling him Inchi and then now going to call him Gaffer. And mm. when they were like some of them were around his age as well, it was it was yeah, it was quite awkward for some. I can imagine it, it must be a weird dynamic mm. for him stepping up and obviously he's still your mate, but he's got to be able to say that was shit, you need to do better here, etc. It must be weird, but I've always wondered as well, kind of off the back of that, whether this is wrong or not, because that season, the first full season he had, we did really well. As I recall, the first half of the season, we were in, in the hunt for the playoffs and Paul Barnes, Kurt Nogan scoring for fun. Obviously, Kurt Nogan went to Preston, which I think I cried about him at, <laughs> at the time when I was about nine. Um, but yeah, it kind of fell away in the second half. And from a fan's perspective, that's always been perceived to possibly be down to when John... Ward left, who was the uh, assistant manager. How was that seen from a player's perspective? Was there, is there any truth to that? Or? Again, I've, I'm, I'm not one to look in too much to things like that. Yeah. The, the, the reason being is I was always led to believe that it didn't matter to me who the manager was. If you're picked in that 11, you go out and play. Yeah. Now, we'll probably get to it in a bit under Chris Waddle. There were certain things he said and do, but he just ignored it. He just went out and played. And, and it's, it's like when John left, John Ward left. He was a great coach, but not a lot changed in training. Our training method still stayed the same. We still played the same. Yeah. Adrian Eve didn't say, go out and do something, anything different. So I don't think you can blame any change behind the scenes. It was just we weren't good enough. Yeah. And I think if you look back at that season, I think we were actually the top scorers in the division that year. Yeah. We finished what we were one place out of the playoffs yeah, or whatever eight, it nine. was, something yeah. like that. Our problem simply was that we let too many goals in. Mm. We all knew that. We just didn't defend it as a team properly. So that needed readjusting. Blaming Ward for leaving, I think, is a bit harsh. She brought Colin Harvey in, and I don't think he was the right answer. But at the end of the day, training sessions were training sessions. Manager put them on, and, yeah. and Adrian Eve was one of these that loved to play um, like a six-a-side game, but with big goals. He used to do that regularly and when Wardy was still here or whether he wasn't. So not a lot changed. I, I can't really be blaming cultures um, and, and stuff like that behind the scenes. It was just one of those things. But that was that was the tough time in the summer when he did decide to go. Yeah. From my point of view, with a year to go on my contract, I was like, I was gutted, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Um, you know, like I say, because he was, uh, I was one of his boys, if you will. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to see the manager go. And I think, I think he's said it a few times since, hasn't he? He's, he's actually, it was one of those decisions that he regrets. He shouldn't have yeah. gone to Everton. Well, yeah, he went and it was when Howard Kendall went back, wasn't it? And it was quite Sorry. a poor period yeah. they had. So you like you like to think if he'd been given another summer, because Chris Waddle, as we'll come on to in a minute, he got loads of money that summer. And you just think if Adrian Heath had maybe been given that to, like you say, improve the defence, because we had a great strike force with Cookie, Paul Barnes was still there. Obviously, mm. got traded for Peyton. Uh, Glenn Little, yourself. It was a really talented squad. So, it'd have been good to have got another year with with, with Inchi to see what would have happened. But moving on to Chris Waddle, I don't know who wants to ask about that. Was it Nick? Yeah, g- going to say. Uh, so, moving on to that next season, then with Chris Chris Waddle, you remained a, a regular in that team. And we've spoke with, well, we've had Mark Robertson come on to the podcast and we've heard his sort of perspective of what happened with Waddle. But from your side, what, what did you feel like went, went wrong for Waddle? Uh, day one. <laughs> when, when, he, when he came in day one, he upset the whole squad. Um, I don't know if, if Robbo said this, but we were, we were training. Every manager and, 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 and coaching staff do things differently when it comes to pre-season. And we were going through a spell with Clive as the assistant or caretaker, whatever he was. We were doing one long session um, of pre-season and then going home. Some like to do a session, have lunch, then come back out and run you again. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Clive just absolutely killed us and then you went home. And what happened on that particular day is, is we've done a really, really hard session. Uh, we come in from the training ground and back then we have to wash your own kit, take it home and, and, and bring it back. Now, I just remember everyone's faces because our tops were just drenched. Everything about us was just wet through. We had a shower. Uh, we all got our kit on the floor, drenched. Uh, and the new management team came in and said hello and said, put your kit back on. So straight away, the senior players are like holding them up, like putting that back on. Well, then we went down to the... Uh, to the um, to pitches again and we he put on the hardest running session I think I've ever done in my life so there's players being sick 
and they haven't even eaten. So it wasn't a very good start from Chris Waddle's point of view. Mm. Knowing that we'd done a really hard session in the morning to then completely just kill us on day one, you've got senior players, they've gone already. They're, they're yeah. not having him. Yeah. They're not yeah. having Glenn Roder. They're thinking he's a clown. You come in and start acting like Sergeant Major on day one, you've lost the dressing room. Yeah. You've lost it. And when you lose the senior players, it filters down. Again, mm. I'm only young. I'm 21, 22 at the time. I'm looking at them and they're like, this isn't right. And I'm like, oh, right. I don't know. It could be the norm for yeah. me. But <laughs> And I could run. I was one of the better runners. And I just and it did kill me, to be fair. But that was it. That was it. Day one. He, he'd lost it for me. He'd lost it. So it was a it was a long road from then onwards. I suppose respect is just almost impossible to get back in it. I think <clears throat> Brian Laws had the same problem at Burnley from what I've heard from other players. Um, you need to go in, especially if there's question marks about you as a manager, which there will have been with Chris Waddle because he never managed before, never managed since either, obviously. But um, what was it like? Because one of the in most interesting things that Robbo told us was uh, when we were asking why it went wrong, he was saying, well, I'm playing in midfield with this guy who, you know, was a right winger in his career. He's playing in centre midfield telling me what to do when he's barely busting, busting, you know, pulling his own weight. And I, I want to turn around and go, pull your own finger out. But he's my manager. So it, it, it must have been weird that I know he played himself everywhere. For, for Nick and Josh's benefit, I remember one game, he played himself as almost like a Makalele role in front of the centre-backs, like a sweeper. <laughs> it was just a bit weird. We didn't know what was going on. Everything about him was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I finished the season. I, we got on really well. We did. At the start of the season, didn't have any respect for him at all. First game of the season, where we were away at Watford, was it? First game yeah, of the yeah. season. Yeah. Me, me and Glenn Little were shopping in Manchester. We weren't even in the squad. Baffling. We weren't even in the squad. So Glenn was out for a long time, which everyone knows, up to yeah. Christmas before he got back in. First game of the season, I wasn't involved. He said to me, you're not, a, you're not a midfielder. So in the reserves leading up to that, I think we've been to Harrogate Town. We played, I think we played in, a, in like a reserve pre-season friendly, me and Glenn. And I, I played in midfield and he played on the wing. And I think we won nine or something nil. And me and Glenn, we had some good games. Mm. And that was like the week leading up to the start of the season. And yet we weren't in the squad. We were looking at each other thinking, what's going on here? Mm. No, I got in literally the week later. So it, it was okay for me. But he said, you're just not a midfielder. He said, you're a wing back. And I'm like, right, right. And that was it. I had to play wing back. And that was me for a few weeks until he changed the formation. And I think if you look over that season, I play right back. I play right wing back. Grimsby away, I played left back. Mm. I played left wing back. I played centre midfield. I just played everywhere. And that just summed his season up. Like you say, he played himself right wing, yeah. sweeper. Grimsby away was the most farcical game of football I think I've ever seen. <laughs> we, got, we got there and he put the team sheet up on a wall and he just named 11 players. He didn't put numbers down. He just named 11 players. So we're all looking at it and we're thinking, crikey, what's going on there? Like Chris Finnecum, the left back, he's not even in it. So well, who's left back then? Gordon Cowan's reserve coach is in it. What's he doing in there? They were quite he, good though. He sat us down well. and he said, these are the best 11 players at the club. He didn't say that's the best left back or that's the best right back or this is this. He went, that's the best 11. He said, that's the team today. We'll sort out positions later. I hope one of them were a keeper. Pardon? I hope one of them were a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> we're working out. We're going out to do a warm-up thinking, what, what are we doing here? And I did. Yeah. I played left back away at Grimsby. We got beat. I'm not surprised. The things he did was, was crazy at first. Yeah. Um, he, didn't, he didn't really help me um, in, in the fact that eventually, just before Christmas, he went to a 4-4-2 at last. He put himself on the right wing and put me on the left. And I'd go up to him and I'd say, you know, do you mind swapping this week? You've got, you know, you like a step over or two. Why don't you go on the left and I'll go on the right? And he's like, no, no, you're all right. You weren't <laughs> bad. Weren't having it. No, weren't having it. it but, it's always, sorry, I was going to say, it's always been interesting as well. Second half of that season, or certainly towards the end of it, we started playing, not necessarily playing well, but we were getting results. I think we, we ended really well um, to an extent. And obviously we had to, to stay up. I, I think you've already answered my next question, which was going to be, you don't think there were any chance of him maybe doing better after one season bedding in? You think it was the right thing that he just got No, out? no, no. I, no I, I think he got it right in the end. Oh, you think he would have? Yeah. I think I think at Christmas, when he stopped playing himself, he played yeah. Glenn, he stuck to a, a rigid 4-4-2. 
Um, our form from Christmas was unbelievable. It was. We yeah. bottom of the league, and and to, we beat Bristol City, who got promoted. We beat Kevin Keegan's Fulham lot at home. Yeah. We were we were beating good teams once we got it right, but it took him that long yeah. to get it right. He in the summer he made he brought loads of players in. They weren't good enough. No, it was no. simple as they they weren't good enough. And like you say, if Adrian Eve had been here, it, it could have been a different story. But he brought players in, he played them, and they just weren't up to it. Yeah. So when he reverted back to a reasonable eleven. You know, we, we show some good form and, and, and he, I think he learned a harsh lesson. And I was surprised when he went because we, mm. we'd gone away on a, a end of season do over to Marbella. Um, and Chris Wood sat us all down and said, lads, I've got some, some bad news. He said, Gaffer's gone. Well, again, half the table were like, oh, right. Oh, gutted. The other half are jumping for joy. Let's get the drinks in. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was, yeah, again, it was a strange year, strange year, strange fella. Um, like I said, I got to know him. I ended up doing a, a presentation one night with him. We're opening up a nightclub, Sidewalk 55 or whatever it was yeah, called. Yeah, I remember Me, it. him and Bernard Manning. I mean, that's a, a trio for you, isn't it? So we gets in the club and, and we goes to this VIP room, me and Chris, well, the gaffer, um, and get the drinks in, right, having a drink. And he just literally sat in the corner by himself the whole night. It just summed yeah. him up. He was a nervous person. Yeah. He's not one for coming out and I'm Chris Waddle, England legend sort of thing. Yeah. He was just a shy person. And it was like that as a manager. It just didn't suit him. Yeah. He was knowledgeable, but nah, it just wasn't right. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the, sorry, sorry, I was say, I wonder if the damage was was done as early as you say then, Paul. If you know what I mean, results picked up, but still senior pros weren't having him. So you know what I mean, they, they have a lot of power at clubs, don't they? Your, your senior they players. They do. They do. But what, what what ends up happening is that you have senior pros that pull yourself to we, we have meetings without the manager. Where yeah. we we ended up saying to each other, look, you hear him on the sideline, just ignore him. We we, yeah. we all know what we're doing on a football pitch. It's not rocket science. Yeah, trained for years for this, um, and and they said, look, lads, we don't want relegation on our CV. Mm-hmm. No matter whether you like him or you don't like him, whether you like Roder or don't like Roder, because a few didn't like him as well. Yeah. We've just got to look after ourselves. We've got to stay in this division and fight for our lives, and that's what we kind of did. So, and that was, and and that's some of the senior players putting us together who weren't in the side. Yeah, that's how good some of the senior players we had in that dressing room. Um, and they've been pushed out. They've been treated like pretty poorly. Yeah. Um, and for them to still go about wanting us to do well, that just summed up the squad that we had and what Inchi had put together. Yeah, that's good. I've got to mention, Paul, one of the best goals I've seen live, Oldham away, where you took it, which, which was, we had to get something. Obviously, it was the game, I think it was the game before Plymouth, where we had to win our last eight season. And you took it down. Your control for that goal is—it it still baffles me when you look at. It. I don't know how you got your ankle that high. He like controls it with his ankle basically here, and then volleys it in off the crossbar. Is it the best goal you ever scored? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it, it sounds better when you say Grobbler was in goal as well. <laughs> really? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But but that summed our season up, didn't it? Three yeah. one up, and we drew three all. Yeah. That goal's all you remember from that game, though. I, I tried to put the result out because if we'd won that day, it took all the pressure off. I know, yeah. I know. We were desperate <laughs> to win that game and, and we played so well. The fans, there were so many at the game. They were, I think they opened the other stand for them, didn't they? Yeah, in the they end. Did, yeah. It was, yeah, it was a good occasion, but it made that last game of the season. <laughs> that was nerve wracking. <laughs> God bless Andy Cook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just just on yourself on a personal level, Paul, uh, you've had your encountered encountered your issues with Crohn's, Crohn's disease, uh, which affected your playing time. Uh, so what were it like, sort of having a spell on sidelines? Obviously, Chris Waddle's gone. Stan Turner's coming in. Team's still struggling a bit. What what's it like not being able to play? Um, it was it was hard. It was hard, especially because Stan's first year they struggled so badly. Yeah. Um, just you know, hovering above the relegation for quite a bit of it and, and being tough, but yeah, it was it, it's difficult when you don't know how long it's going to be. When when you when you when you've done your cruciate, you know, roughly it's a year. When you've yeah. done your hamstring, you know, it's two to six weeks. But when when it's tummy problems, mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So it was a, it was a long long road, um, probably about a year before a decision was made on surgery. Um, it started on New Year's Eve on under Chris Waddle, <laughs> basically that season. Wow. Um, I just started to bleed. Um, Tommy wasn't good. Uh, it just got worse as the season went on. So do I look back and blame Chris Waddle? 
<laughs> kind of, because yeah. at the time, it's not Crohn's disease at the time, it was colitis. Okay. Uh, so my large, my large bowel is full of ulcers. Uh, no, and they say no. ulcers is, is stress-related. Yeah. Um, so you're stressed because you're bottom of the league. Mm-hmm. You're out of contract in a few months. Got a mortgage to pay. Um, so maybe yeah. I don't feel maybe. like a stressed person, but it eats you up inside. So it started then. The summer got worse out of contract. Stan yeah. comes in. Um, and yeah, difficult. And, and it's the hardest part about it is I've done all right that season. I've got Harry Redknapp on the phone, come down to West Ham. Oh, wow. So I'm on steroids. My face, well, it's even fatter than it was. It is now. But I have spots <laughs> all over my forehead from the side effects of steroids. Um, yeah, it was a really, really difficult, difficult time, if I'm to be honest. Um, I went I went down to to um, West Ham and trained with them for a little bit. Mm-hmm. I got Stan in, on the phone saying, come back. Um, and I played two games for West Ham and, and it went quite well. I'm playing with literally their whole first team and me. So I thought, wow, this is pretty good. Um, but then Harry just said, nah, but he said, Stan's been on the phone. They want a million pounds for you. And if it goes to tribunal, it could be anything. It could be a fiver. It could be ridiculous. It could be whatever. And we yeah. can't take that chance. So I came back, um, signed my contract after a bit of arguing over 50 quid again. <laughs> 50 quid. Um, with Stan and signed me contract for three years and went and sat in hospital for a year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pretty much it, really. You return to the team, though, Paul. Um, obviously, in the promotion season, one of my favourite seasons as a Burnley fan towards the end. And again, a goal that lives long in my memory, lots of Burnley fans' memory. Oxford away, um, when a certain Ian Wright crossed it in for you. You'd have thought it'd be the other way around, but... <laughs> Got your nod on it. Yeah. Crucial, crucial goal. What was that like coming back into the team after all them issues and being, you know, a, a crucial part of getting us up with that goal? It was, it's the strangest scenario ever because I was on the transfer list. Yeah. I don't know if I officially was. I think it was just Stan playing mind games with me. But we'd had a big argument in January. I'd, I'd been back training since the start of the year, but because I had a year out, I'd lost. My, I'd lost my legs. I, I didn't have Steve Davis legs anyway, but I'd lost my legs. I'd lost the bit of muscle that I did have. And he just said, you're miles off it yet. And I didn't agree. You know, you're a young lad. You think you know it all, that sort of thing. Um, and we had a big argument in January. Um, and he said, right, we'll go on the transfer list and go then. And I went, right, fair enough then. Um, and at the time, I'd had my first knee operation under Waddle. And my knee wasn't quite right. There was floating cartilage still in my knee. So I thought, well, I'll go and get that sorted. So then when I do move, I'll be flying. So I had that done early February. Um, I had 10 weeks, no, eight or nine weeks out. And when I came back from that, I joined in with the first team. Now, I I don't know if you know much about Gorethorpe back then, but Gorethorpe was quite heavy pitches. It's quite, you know, takes it out of your legs, really, when you train there all the time. The lads have gone through quite a bit of the season, so they're, they're goosed anyway. Well, I've come back and I'm fresh. I'm raring to go. So in training, I look kind of good. Mm. Um, and like I say, I'm still on the transfer list and the team sheet goes up for Oxford and I'm on it. I'm on, the, I'm in the squad traveling to Oxford. Now my initial reaction is the bastard's taking me down there to piss me off, isn't he? <laughs> He's taking me all the way to Oxford to annoy me. So I have to get on the coach. You have to go. And then when he picks the actual team and the subs, I'm on the bench. I'm like, I'm waiting for Jeremy Beadle to pop out. I'm thinking, <laughs> this is like, what's he doing? He's not spoke to me in months. I'm, I'm on the bench and we literally were joking. Right. He said, look, this like we're having a beast here. He said, we need to get on and save it. You run down the line, cross it and I'll let it in. And that is God's honest. He said that. Um, and, and the best bit is, is when I did get on, I've gone down the right hand side and I've gone to cross it and I've completely mishit it. I've not told anyone this. And it went to the edge of the area and Steve Davis volleyed it in, didn't he? For the equal. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's like, oh, great ball, Weller. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> when, I was starting, when I was starting the question, I was about to say and an assist. But yeah. I, I couldn't believe that one. It was complete yeah. shank. Didn't mean it. I'm putting it in the box and it's like great anyway. ball. So yeah, yeah, I'm thinking this is good. But yeah, popped up in between two players when Wrighty ran into that corner, heading it. Yeah. Weird. And apparently weird exclusive. Uh, didn't mean to do it, but he said it here first. Yeah. <laughs> the whole day was just weird. Going to do the the um the presser afterwards. And there they are. Oh, Paul, we believe that you've come off the transfer list and you want to stay. And I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah. 
Stan's mind games again. I didn't even know. I don't know. Was I on it? Was I not on it? I don't know. And that was it. I didn't play again. That was crucial it. Part, Done me bit, and then he dropped me after that. Crucial, crucial part in that promotion, though. And, and we did just touch on Ian Wright. What was it like to... I mean, at the time, he was doing his um, his TV show and everything, so I don't I don't even know if he lived locally, but what were, you, what were that like in the dressing room? When you heard Ian Wright were coming, did you all just go... Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. What was that like? I've always found that odd. It, it wasn't so odd for us because when we used to go to away games, we used to go and stand on a Friday night in a hotel in London, for example, and, and Stan would have these legends turn up while we're eating our dinner. We'd be sat there having our dinner and Vinnie Jones would walk in, all right, Stan, and come and say hello to everyone. So we kind of got used to Stan knowing these like legends, if you will. Um, so when he came through the door, you just don't know what to expect. You're not sure if he's going to be shy, he's going to be here I am or what he was. Um, but but he was very much like that. He walked through the doors and he put his arms in the air and he said, here I am. Um, he, he turned up in a Ferrari one week, a, a Harley Davidson the next. You think he's big and flash, but he's just the nicest guy you ever want to meet. Yeah. Even though he's, he just talked to anybody, he was just, he's, he was brilliant. Simple as that, really. I know he didn't have much of an impact on the pitch as, as yeah. probably what he wanted or Stan wanted, but he ended up being a great sub that came on and won us games. Yeah. But just having him around the place just took the pressure off everybody. Um, and a genuinely lovely, lovely guy. Really nice guy. Oh, it's good to hear that because you get a perception in your head and that's just what he looks like. And you, it, it's sometimes sad when we've had these and, and we hear, oh, he's a ball bag. Not about Ian Wright, but <laughs> yeah. certain people that you hear us, it's good to hear that backed up, really. Yeah. Nice, no, honestly, top guy. Like I say, he's, he did. He gives it. He gives it that. But then he smiles, and his smile just lifts the room. Yeah. And 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 there was there was a few people that would say, "Hold on, he's not here Monday, Tuesday. He's off doing his TV show or whatever." But when yeah. he was there on Thursday, Friday, he put a shift in, and he wasn't one for, you know, just tossing it off. He he put a shift in, and he was he was he was brilliant. He really was. That's great. So promotion assured and a change of position for yourself, becoming a, a marauding right wing back. And then you built a great relationship with Glenn Little down at right hand side. What was he like to play alongside? Glenn, mate, yeah, Glenn was the best player I've ever played with. And I've, when I say that, I have to say it lightly in that I played with Gazza and Wrighty and Waddle. I didn't play with them in their heyday. Mm, but yeah. Glenn Little was, was, for a very big lad, unbelievable feat. Unbelievable. Yeah, really well. um, going forward, superb. If he had to turn around and run back, he didn't kind of like that. That wasn't really his sort of thing. A six foot four or whatever he was, useless in the air. But give him the ball. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Now, that season, I was lucky again because I come back. Stan had pulled me in Portugal when we had the end of season drink. He, he actually pulled me and said, next year is going to be your year. Um, and I just laughed him off like, yeah, whatever. Um, but pre-season came, we started the games. Glenn got injured in pre-season, so he sort of changed his formation a bit and he went with his back five. Mm. Um, and I managed to get the, the, the right wing back spot. And I weren't sure how Glenn was then going to fit in into the team. Yeah. Uh, was he going to play in a three? What was Glenn going to do? But Glenn sort of played as a right winger with me behind him. Yeah. It was a bit of a lopsided formation, but it kind of worked for so long. You know, we'd done, we'd done ever so well. We were top of the league at one point, weren't we? So yeah. it was working absolutely, for a bit. Absolutely fantastic that season. I, in my opinion, you might have a different perspective, but I'd say that was the best football you played for us. Um I always remember a goal he scored against Wimbledon where you beat about four players down the right-hand side and smashed it in. They were quite a big team. I mean, they'd just been relegated from the Premier League and that was, I think it was our first home game. I might be wrong. It was, um, yeah. So, yeah, is that how you saw it as well? Like, the, Was that you, the, at your peak, would you say? Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that season because it was my comeback season and having such a difficult few years. Okay. Um, I think I played 40-odd games. I, I, you know, I won a lot of player of the year award so I was very very happy with that I think I enjoyed the the next few years a little bit more because I then went back to sentiment field yeah I enjoyed that right wing back is a oh, horrible position you, you're expected to cross it in and then expected to defend on your goal line it's yeah. Yeah. it's hard work it's up and down sort of um sort of position but it, it served us well for a couple of years um I think the last time we played it was against Blackburn Rovers and we never played it again so um it was uh, yeah, it was it was good times. That year was was a great year. Um, we should have got in the playoffs. That's the biggest regret. Yeah, yeah. So we were we were talking to Tony Grant about about this um, last week, I think it was. Um, yeah. So he just missed out on the playoffs in two thousand and two after what Luke described as a stunning first half of the season. I, I can't remember. It was. We were top. 
Um, but Thanks. yeah, so we, we chatted to, to Tony and he couldn't really put his, his finger on the, the reason sort of where it went wrong. And he, he, he sort of said maybe it was a team over performing up until Christmas and then you just couldn't keep it up. Do you, any any thoughts from you, Paul? Was it was it was that the case? Was it an overperforming team who who just couldn't couldn't keep it up? Or no, I'm not sure. Um, whether we were overperforming, um, maybe that's a bit harsh on the team. Yeah. Um, I think probably under after Christmas we really underperformed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to be top going into the Manchester City game. And to not make playoffs is a, is a big collapse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really know why we why it went pear shaped. Um, some people have talked about because we in, in January we made our million pound signing, didn't we? Our first one, Ian Moore came in and did that work? Did it not work? Um, because we had some issues up front then. Um, I don't know what how it why it didn't work. I really don't know. Um, I don't know. It literally did go pear shaped from the Manchester City game, really. Um, Glenn missed the penalty, so we can really just blame Glenn. Really. <laughs> Could have scored that. It might have been a different season. You know, I don't want to blame my favourite ever Burnley player, which Glenn. Well, Glenn and Robbie combined. I can't. I never. I can never. Lou, we've, got, Lou, we've got Paul Weller on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I said it the same. I've had to pick my favourite. You know, I was there a long time, and and those two were my favourite too as well. They, yeah. they were good. Um, but I, I still tell Glenn daily. He texts me every day, and I still tell him that he because he went on quite a long time in his career. He played quite late in his career, yeah. and I said that's because I done most of your running while you were at Burnley. <laughs> you know, like play on for years. I think you're probably right, though. I think if you'd put that away, sorry, Glenn, to say this, not that you'll ever watch it, but if you do, I do. I, I think we'd have at least made the playoffs. I, it just felt because City were second. It, that was like the the game. It was at Main Road. Um, where we were like having to prove ourselves. I think if we'd gone there and got a point or three, I think that was to level it up. I think they'd taken the lead and it would go in for equalise, as I remember. I think if he'd scored that, I, I genuinely do think we might have gone up that season because some of the football we were playing, we had Glenn on the right, Alan Moore at the time, superb on the left. So you had these wingers just bombing on. Gareth Taylor, Ian Moore up top. We were a really attacking team. I remember us away at Bradford, we won 3-2. Some of the football we were playing, it, it was stunning. It was better than we've played, you know, now. And the promotion teams have had under, under Sean Dyche, as much as I love yeah. Sean. That's not criticism of him, but there we go. But if you ask Stan, Stan blames me for the Man City game. Does he? Oh, yeah, I didn't even play. <laughs> <laughs> I got me a the you? week before. Five bookings, so I missed the Man City game. So you blame me. Oh no! Like the whole season, I played like forty-two or whatever it was. The only couple I missed was the Man City one and another one. So you blame me. Got in the dressing room afterwards. I had a right go on me. Brilliant. Oh boy, you're, you're there, still suit, suit and tied. You're like, what? What have I, I done? Glenn sat over there, like laughing at me. He's missed the penalty, and there's me like, what? Yeah. Brilliant. Wow. That's Real. Good, yeah. So. So that's well that season. Then Gaza came in for a few months, and what was he like with the lads? With such a massive character, different, a bit different, mm. <laughs> a bit different. Um, I, I'm a I'm a Spurs fan. Growing up, was a absolutely love Spurs to bits. So obviously, Waddle before that was brilliant. But when Gaza walked through the doors, it was like a different world. You just thought, wow, now we're talking. Yeah. Now when he joined in training. It, then all of a sudden, uh, our, our opinion changed a little bit because training was quite quick, quite fast, and I don't think he was really expecting it to be as zippy as that. Yeah. You saw moments of magic, don't get me wrong from him, but he was a bit million miles off it. Yeah. When he dressed him, he was funny. We'd done the usual stuff. We were, we were still old school. We're, we're still cutting up socks. We're still doing things to people's cars and all sorts of stupid stuff. And when he arrived, we'd done all his clothes. We'd done the usual stuff. Um, and again, I don't know if Granty or, um, or Robert have mentioned, but we used to have a court, a kangaroo court every Friday. Um, so on a Friday, it's Stan used to get everyone sat down and, and basically it's a way of getting fine money into the club to have a good drink at the end of the year. Um, and you can bring up things on people who's not done this, who's done that. So on anyway, he goes to Gaza. Are you sure you don't want to bring anything up? He goes, no, 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 I don't want to bring anything up. Nothing, nothing. Why? And he knew that we'd cut all these clothes up and done everything to him. He said, no, 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 I've got nothing to bring up at all. I've got my own back. So we're all like, 
All right. Well, he just leans behind him and pulls out this biggest bottle of laxatives ever. And it's, well, there's only about a third left. Oh. Well, that morning, <laughs> that morning we didn't realise, but in the middle of the table is a huge jug of tea and Gazza had made it. <laughs> well, I didn't have any. But he just said, hope you enjoyed your tea. Well, there's people like Gordon Armstrong there, like sat like old men with their legs crossed. He's on his third cup, just spits it out everywhere. Now, Stan's laughing, and then he's now realised we've got a game tomorrow. <laughs> Half of that lactose in there. and oh. But that was Gaza. That was Gaza. He was up to all sorts. He was, he was, um, yeah, Jimmy Five Bellies in there quite a lot. He was a nice lad. They were doing just silly things. Go and get, um, go to the butty shop around the corner for me. And when he came back with it, he was meeting his uh, agent afterwards and he, he just opened it up, took all the cheese out and put sliced soap in there. Ready for his agent. It was, they were just up to stuff all the time. It was just, it was funny. You see all these pranks on TV that he's done and stupidness and he done it at Burnley as well. He was, he was good on that sense. He was funny. It was just, his football side of it wasn't good. He had a bit of a tough, tough time. Um, mm. And also he was going through issues himself. He, yeah, yeah. he had um, he had this brown suitcase that he'd carry around with him all the time. We tried to break into it. We couldn't get into it. Um, but if you if you jangled it about a bit, it used to clutter and yeah, yeah, yeah. bottles and all sorts of stuff in there. That yeah, It was sad. It was sad yeah. because a legend at the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah, indeed. And it's a shame it didn't work out because... <clears throat> For Josh and Nick's benefit, obviously Paul will know, but last game of the season, we needed one goal to get in the playoffs. Uh, just one goal. We missed out by a goal. <laughs> well, I'll never forgive Ian Moore for missing from a yard out at Deepdale. Um, but yeah, he missed. He had these free kicks. Last couple of minutes of the game, he had two free kicks. Uh, all I were right behind him, all the world they were going in. Just imagine the story that that had been. Gaza gets Burnley into the playoffs up last day, but Magnus, bloody headman. <laughs> um, obviously unfortunate I suppose off the back of that season but ITV Digital then went belly up Paul which massively impacted the club because we spent quite a bit on people like Gaza uh, Ian Moore Robbie Blake and sadly the team started to get not necessarily stripped back but we, we did obviously lose a few players what was that like around the club because it was a shame because we, we felt like we just missed our opportunity, I think, because we could have just got there before that money kind of went down the pan. Um, and you, you did see the likes of yourself, Glenn um, and Stan eventually end up leaving the club. What, what was the atmosphere around the place around in the last few days? Yeah, it, was, it was the last couple of seasons were tough. Um, there were the, the squad was getting depleted. Um, it, was, it was trying to bank on free transfers. And it was trying because we bought the likes of David May in, you know, Luke Chadwick. We've got some, some quality players in still. Uh, but it still seemed to be a struggle all the time. It seemed to be tough. The, the squad was never big enough. Yeah. There were so many times that I was on the bench when I was nowhere near fit. Again, I remember being at Manchester City at home and I was on the bench. And well, he, he completely stitched me up, Stan. I'd only, I'd only started running that morning or jogging that morning with the physio. I wasn't even in the squad. I had my boots down at the training ground and he called me in before the game and he said, how are you? And I said, oh, I started running today and, you know, it's all right. Maybe sprinting tomorrow, may kick a ball later in the week, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, good, you're on the bench. I went, what? I had to go down to Gawthorpe to get me boots. And after 30 minutes, he said to me, do you want to go on? And I'm like, no, no. But that's, that's what the squad was like back then. You know, it was, it was, it was a struggle. Um, it was a struggle seeing, it was a struggle seeing players like Gareth Taylor leave. Yeah, you were quite. That 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 was a big blow for us. Yeah, Gaz was, I think, one of the. We talk about some good players at Burnley in my time. I, I think he went unnoticed. I don't think he got the credit he really deserved. Um, he was he was a good player, the biggest winger I've ever played with. <laughs> a typical striker, you know what they're like. You have to pass to him at every opportunity. But a great lad, brilliant in the air, but also good with his feet. And when we started losing players like him, you just knew it was it was it wasn't good. Yeah. The club are asking the big hitters to start taking pay cuts. They never asked me. Don't worry about that. I never got that call. <laughs> but they were asking the, those players, and those players were then feeling it a little bit. They're like thinking, should I, should I not? Got bills to pay. Mm. It's not their fault that they're on these wages. I want to say big hitters compared to the rest of the division. Burnley yeah. have always been the worst payers ever. 
ever since I came in 91 in Division 4, worst players. They're probably still the worst players in the Premier League now. Definitely, yeah. Probably. So there have always been terrible play- players. Um, but yeah, you could feel it on some of the senior players' shoulders. Um, yeah. and, and it was tough. It was tough. It was tough that we were brought in Robbie Blake, uh, uh, you think, at the right time, but he was injured. Yeah. That rest of that season when he came in, he was injured with a hernia and we never saw the rest, the best of Blake that year. Um, yeah, it was it was unfortunate because we were so close on so many occasions and it was it was a sad end really to it all. And just off the back of that, Paul, because I think we expected Glenn to go just because I don't know how we held on to him for so long, really. And I know he'd been out on loan a couple of times. It was a huge shock when Stan's contract were re- weren't renewed, but also yourself, like I, from a fan's perspective, you were obviously out of contract and we never really understood. I'm guessing it was because Stan left, was it, that you weren't retained or what What were the story there? Because it was a weird one that you went from a fan's perspective anyway. It was um, the whole situation of me leaving was my own fault in that I, I never had an agent and I was never in the belief that I should have an agent. I was happy where I was and whatever will be, will be. Yeah. But I look back and it was probably the biggest mistake I ever made by not having an agent. Now, an agent would have been selfish, would have looked after me as well as themselves, would have looked after me because I'm their, I'm their thing, aren't I? They've got to protect me and do what's right for me. Now, in January of that year, I went to see Stan and had a good conversation about my contract up in the summer. What's the plan? He said, you're on this at the moment. He said, next year, the budget is being slashed. Mm. He said, and for me to offer you a contract now, you've got to take virtually a 50% cut. And he said, you're 50% cut now. If you take this now and I offer you a contract now, what you lose between now and the end of the season, you've got to work all next year for virtually. He said, it wouldn't make mm-hmm. sense. So I went, right, okay. Now an agent would have, would have done something about that. They wouldn't have accepted that. Now my knee was goosed. I'm due my fourth knee operation again. It's not right. Between then and the end of the season, I'm not training and I'm playing at weekends. Now what happened at Sunderland on the last game of the season, I went off with cramp. Last game of the season, cramp because I hadn't been training. Yeah. So I'd done that because I thought, well, Stan's going to stay and I'll get my contract. Yeah, yeah. An agent wouldn't have done that. An agent would have protected me. They'd have said, look, there's no guarantees at the end of the year. Let's get your knee sorted in January. Yeah. I would have got myself sorted in January. I would have been fresh, hungry, ready to go. And even come pre-season, if Bernie didn't keep me, I'm ready to go again somewhere. Yeah. Well, I didn't. It went all pear shape. Stan got announced as not staying. We're all out of contract. What do we do? We're in limbo. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that clown Cottrell comes in. And that was it, really. It was literally the night before my wedding. Oh, really? I'm out having a drink the night before my wedding, getting married on a Saturday. He rings me Friday night on the phone, just saying, I'm not keeping you. I said, brilliant timing. Glad you could do it oh, to me man. face. And that was it. But this is the frustrating bits because you've got loads of people saying, oh, you've been there 12 and a half years. Loyalty. And all that. I said, loyalty means nothing. He's just been me over the phone. Yeah. yeah. I went in the following week, saw Dave Emerson. Dave Emerson gave me my P45 and my boots. and went, there you go. I said, right, where's my shin pads that I've had 12 and a half years? Mm. I've had the same shin pads. Where are they? Oh, we're just having it redecorated in the boat room. They'll be in the bin now. <gasps> oh, I could have knocked the lanky piece of shit out. I tell you. I <laughs> anyway, I'm like fuming. That is shocking. And this is the bits where people say loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. And I'm like, well, there's no loyalty back. Yeah. That's it. See you later. Bye-bye. Get yourself gone. And that was it. I walked out of the club thinking, that's it. That's such a shame. That's it. So, yeah, it's frustrating because I should have had my knee done. And then I had my knee done after my wedding. And my knee was goosed. It's goosed. It needed longer to recover. And you're trying to then earn a contract. And that was basically the end of my football career. Yeah. I didn't make the right decisions. If I'd have made those right decisions, um, like I say, an agent would have protected me better and looked after me better. My career would have gone on a lot further, a lot longer. Yeah, because you weren't, how old were you, Paul? Right? I'm going to say like 30, 31. For 29. 29. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such I a toyed, shame that. I toyed with football afterwards. Um, I went and done pre-season with Brassy because he was a manager at York. Yeah. And he said, you can use our physio. <laughs> Crikey. My missus could have done better than that. It, <laughs> it weren't the best. Yeah. It wasn't the best. So I ended up at, I got a phone call from Rochdale. Um, mm. Steve Parkin said, come on down. He said, we'll get you fit here. Let's get you going, get you up and running. Um, so I went down there and, and I was I was way off the pace. I was joining with the kids to try and get fit, picking up little niggles. And then I sort of got myself half fit, thinking I'm doing all right, a little bit better. 
I'm looking around the place for I haven't got to get much fitter anyway to sort of stand out here, trying to be yeah. confident. Yeah. Um, and in the end, I went to the manager and I just said, look, it's a money thing, isn't it? And he went, what do you mean? I said, if I said to you this Saturday, I'll, I'll play for free. Would you play me? He went, yeah. So that Saturday, I played centre midfield against Rushton and Diamonds for nothing. Wow. So I thought, if I'm going to get fit, I need to get fit playing first team football yeah. rather than yeah. just with the stiffs and it doesn't really get you that fit. So yeah, I played five games for Rochdale. Um, he changed the formation every game. I moved positions every game. It was like, my God, I'm playing against Lincoln where the, where the centre half ran forward and the goalkeeper kicked it and the centre half flicking it on. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Yeah. It was just, I didn't enjoy it. The training was all over the place. Rochdale just went and trained. They rang around in the morning to see where they could train. It was, and my knees weren't right. And then when he came to me and said, look, I think we can give you some expenses, 150 quid a week to the end of the season. Mm. I just said to him, I said, I'm not being funny. I can go and collect trolleys at Asda earn more money. I said, let's just call it a day. And that's it. I just walked out and went. And that so, was retirement there and then, Paul, were it? Yeah. Was it the right thing? Was I being stupid? Did Rochdale paint just a different picture that I'm used to when I was being a bit spoiled? I have lots of regrets in my career. Everyone mm. will do. I yeah. could have done this. You could have done that. I should have persevered. I should have stuck with it. I should have just played for free for quite a few months and just play, play, play and get yourself right. Yeah, yeah. Whether, whether it's the right environment, you, you, you don't know, but I'm quite a stubborn person. So I just thought, nah, yeah. things were catching up on me. Yeah, I, I had I had little things, arthritis in your hips and wear and tear of football eventually gets you. But 30, 31, I thought, if I carry on, what am I going to be like at 34, 35? Yeah. And that's so, yeah. If, if you're not enjoying it. Mm, tough, yeah. tough. It's a shame how it ended, Paul. We just wanted to certainly call this out because it's a book I've had pre-ordered since it went up on Amazon probably in about December, something like that. But probably around the time this will come out because we – we do record them a few weeks in advance. We've, we have a footballer a week, so I'm, I, d I don't know, but it might actually line up quite well. But your book comes out April 12th, I believe. Um, I, I, I just wondered if you had any words on that. Is there any crazy revelations we should expect? I know it's been part written by Dave Thomas, who is, for the people who know, have written so many great Burnley books down the years that I've really enjoyed. So just wanted to give that a shout out. Should we expect some... Uh, more Dave Edmonds. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't know well. what you're on about. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone, make sure you buy Paul's book. Yeah. yeah well, I, I tell you what, I can give you whether it might get announced beforehand. But basically, I've I've been. I used to bump into Dave every year on holiday, and he and he was asking me for a long time. He wanted to do something on '90s Burnley. And because yeah. I was there for the nineties, he said, let's, let's go for the managers. Let's just talk about it. And my memory is not great. I have to constantly ring Glenn Little and various other people to talk about certain things that have happened to just drop my memory a little bit. And um, it, it was a struggle, but it, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I've, I've, I've read it again and think, crikey, I've missed this and I've missed that. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it coming out. Um, but, but what I will say, and I've not announced this yet to anybody is that, I only get a little bit of money out of this per book, everyone you sell. But every bit that I make is going to the Gary Parkinson Trust. Oh, fantastic. Um, it actually does say it on the back. No one, no one's seen it yet, but there, there is a bit there right at the bottom that's going to say. Um, so my little bit of proceeds is going to go there to help Gary because because Gaz and his family are going through such a difficult time for many, many yeah. years. So the little bit of money that does come out of this is hopefully going to uh, just help Gary and his family. That's, That's fantastic. Amazing. If anyone watching this needed any more reason, make sure you get on Amazon and type in Paul Weller. I've got the full title. Not such a bad life. Burnley, Gaza, Righty, Waddle and me out April 12th. <laughs> so make sure you get on that. We'll get the link down below as well. <laughs> Cheers. Right. Last thing, if it's all right, Paul. Um, yep. We've just got a little five-question quiz about your career, if that's okay. All right, okay. <laughs> I think, to be honest, because I wrote these earlier, and I think you answered most questions while we've been <laughs> chatting. So, uh, maybe five out of five. Top the scoreboards already. Yeah. Tony Grant got four. So, in terms of the Burnley players, I think I think you have a chance to be top because I don't think Robbo got five. Tony Grant got four. No, no, he did. Yeah, I think I think we've not had a five out of five Burnley player. Tony Worthfuls. <laughs> I stitched him up on first question. <laughs> 
<laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, right, okay, so we'll go straight into it on uh, question one. You made almost 300 appearances for Burnley. Who was your Burnley debut against? Debut was Leicester. It was, yes, Leicester City, um, which you mentioned earlier, League Cup. Um, so, yeah, what, what were that like? You were just desperate for your chance and... Like yeah, they'd lost the first leg, so there was no pressure really to um, to go out and do anything magical, win the game or anything. It was uh, it was it was a big learning curve. Simon Grayson was left back for Leicester, okay. so yeah, experienced player, and yeah, it was, it was it was a tough tough debut. And I played with all the regular first team players, Parkey and and, and everybody, so it was, you know, it was a good experience. And it basically just whet your appetite to really want more of it. You, know, yeah. you really really want that, and and it was yeah, it was a good season. Do you think she said the manager at the time, um, sort of giving you those little bits? I'll, I'll, pl I'll play you now, and then I'm not playing you again until you've got a new contract. Do you think that were a ploy then to sort of give you that little bit of a taste to say, oh, I want to do this. I'll forget the fifty quid. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, I think he was still under pressure as well because right side of midfield back then was still John Francis. If you ask a lot of Burnley fans, John Francis is still a bit of a legend. He scored, you know, some important goals in in the, in the fourth division and that. So, you know, they, he was still in that position. He, no disrespect to John, I thought I was a lot better than John. So that's why it was it was a challenge. The manager, whether John was coming to the end of his career, because he had knee, knee problems as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there was there was it, was it was hard for the manager to sort of ease a sort of person that's well respected by the fans for a young lad. So I don't know. It was a bit of a transition that sort of year for for for, for Jimmy Mullen and for me and for a lot of people. So uh, um, I'm, I'm glad he did it in the end. Um, okay, brilliant. Question two. Uh, how many league goals did you score for Burnley? We've got a choice of three. It's nine, ten or eleven. Oh, like a clue. <laughs> um, well, because at the start you said I scored 13 goals. 13 so, goals. So and I only thought I scored 11. So you done me straight away. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm no good at, we'll carry on. I'm, I'm no good at, at any of this. And I told you my memory's awful. I only remember two or three of the goals that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I don't know, league goals, I'd go with nine. It was 11. Was it oh, yeah. Well, they all your league then. <laughs> Where's the other two come from then? You said 13. Luke had a bit of As I say, you, you, you were, you were a bit fanboy over your pull. I think he's yeah. only a bit fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he got two two in the FA Cup as well. Ah, right, right, okay. Um, so number three, you received one red card in your Burnley career, as, as far as I could tell. Anyway, I've only I've only charged you with one. Who was that against? Millwall. <laughs> and uh, a scuffle with Dennis Wise, I believe. Yeah, Dennis Wise. Miller <laughs> deserved it. He's he's up there with Robbie Savage that you want to slap any a pair of them. Oh my God. There was nothing in it. If you watch it, it's basically he's 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 got in my face, and I've just sort of pushed him away, get away, and he stumbled back, and you're like, oh, Howard Webb making a name for himself. Yeah. Oh God, absolute goon. So yeah, it was the worst red card ever. Stands and if you're gonna get sent off, at least punch him in the face. <laughs> Do it, you know, make it worthwhile. It was rubbish, terrible, terrible. Um, was that the season? It seemed quite. Was that for a place in quarter final? You played Millwall and they went on to make the final, didn't they? Lost to Man United. Yeah. Alan Moore killed me. Alan Moore had the clearest header. I don't know if you remember this. I do. Cross came in and he had the goal gaping. Head it yeah. in, win 1 0, take the pressure off me being sent off. Yeah. Gaffer won't mention that. No, he heads it over the bar. Oh. <laughs> what did you that, on that point, Paul, what was the. Uh, this isn't that season, but. FA Cup, we did make the quarter-final one year, and I remember travelling down to Watford, we lost 2-0. Um, and when I saw the team sheet, no Glenn, no Robbie, I felt sick. What, what was the what was the perspective of players then? Because that was, that was surely your shot at a semi-final. Yeah, we, we were like hoping Stan gets sacked. He needs to go. The bench, Robbie, Glenn, me, Steve Davis. It were mental. Four of us on the bench. We're like, what's he doing? So uh, you know now when the, when you look back and think, well, he's he's, he's seeing the future because now they don't take the FA Cup seriously, do they? No. They rest the best players for the league. Well, that's surely what Stan was doing, wasn't it? 
Bobby, Glenn, Paul, Stevie Davis will save you for the league campaign. And we didn't realise at the time, we do now. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go yeah. with that to save Stan's bacon because that yeah. absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> what my dad got there, I won't repeat what my dad said when he saw the team sheet. But program went about three rows in front. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you should have you should have been in the dressing room with me, Glenn. <laughs> 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 Robbie, we weren't best pleased either. Um, right, question four. Who was your Burnley league debut against? I mentioned this as well. Maybe not. League. So it was in uh, December. You, Carlisle. December it was Carlisle. 2 0 win um, over Carlisle. Um, straight on, finally, question five. Who was your final Burnley appearance against? Sunderland. It was Sunderland, as you mentioned. Went off uh, went off with cramp. Um I just wanted to touch I've seen on your Twitter, Paul, you you are a Spurs fan, you've mentioned it. And it's been a very Burnley Burnley based podcast, as it as it obviously would be, but what are your thoughts on Spurs? I, I, I sense you, you're not a huge fan of Jose. And he might be gone by the time this comes out in about a month's time. Oh, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I've not been a fan of him for a few years. He came in a special one, transformed yeah. the Premier League, Chelsea. He's, he's, he, I think it's just his body language that done me when he first came in. Looking at his sour face when he was at, um, at Man United, it just weren't for me. Tottenham, I've been a, a Tottenham fan, like I say, since I was a kid. A lot of people don't agree with me. Okay, mm. I've been brought up the way of watching great football, being entertained, and winning nothing. Yeah, that's yeah. Tottenham. That's yeah. me. I love being entertained because at the end of the day, I believe it's an entertainment business. Mm-hmm. Jose Mourinho is not an entertainer. No, he's a part of the bus, bore you to bits, and it's proved it. And me and Robbie are having a few arguments at the moment about it because he thinks it's the best signing Tottenham have made, and I'm like, no chance. He'll win you something. He has got us through to the Carl- what, the Cup, yeah, it's yeah, called yeah. Caribou Cup. We've had the luckiest draws ever, Brentford and all them. But Man City are going to absolutely murder them. Murder <laughs> yeah. them. Tottenham yeah. are a million miles away from being a decent team. Yeah. Their, their, their defence and goalkeeper is not up to it anymore. And people are saying, we'll give him time. Well, he's had three transfer windows mm-hmm. and he's still not made any impact on that back four. So... The thing with Mourinho as well is you, you just know it's short term. You just know the dummy's going to get spat out within the next 12 months. So there's no longevity there, is there? No. It just feels a bit... I, I know Pochettino had a crap six months or whatever it was, but I, I don't know. Who am I to say what Daniel Levy should have done, but I'd have given him a bit longer. He were never going to be in trouble. No, um, no it's a strange one. I agree with everything you said as a Man United fan who, who sat through... A very good first Mourinho season, and then yeah, it's just that's what he's he's, he's about now. Yeah, downhill negative football, but yeah, yeah. seems seems a, a perfect place to to end it. Paul, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely brilliant. Some great stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look after yourself. Buy Paul's book. And Buy Paul's uh, book. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, mate. All yeah. right, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you so much, Paul. Thanks, mate. Bye. Bye. Bye.